I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is impossible to be in such a place at such a time and not feel the weight of history, and also to be reminded of the power of Christ in his church to preserve it, to protect it. We rejoice in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Speaking of the American South, William Faulkner famously said that in the South, the past is not forgotten. It's not even past. <laughs> that was probably more true in decades past than it is now, but still we understand exactly what Faulkner meant. There is a sense in which the past is not only not forgotten, it's not even past. Faulkner did not mean that of the South as what we might think of as a compliment, simply an observation. It could be negative in its connotation, carrying what others have described as the burdens of history. And history does come with its burdens, and we are regularly reminded of those. But there's a sense in which, by God's grace, for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, that is as it should be. In fact, that is as it must be, that the past is not forgotten. It's not even past. It would be meaningful in a sense if we were to be gathered here because there had been Christians at one time who believed the gospel that Martin Luther preached. That might be noteworthy and significant, but hollow, deadly hollow. But we are here because Christians now believe that same gospel that Luther preached because Luther was convinced it was the gospel that the apostles preached. And furthermore, because Luther believed it is the gospel that saves. And so it is. I refer us to Scripture, to Romans chapter 3. We'll read together Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 21. This is the word of the Lord. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there's no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. The title of the sermon is Dr. Hyperbolicus and the Gospel. Dr. Hyperbolicus, where did that title come from? Erasmus of Rotterdam declared that Martin Luther was Dr. Hyperbolicus. What did he mean? Well, he didn't mean it as a compliment. He meant it that Martin Luther's theology was hyperbole. Just think of the solas of the Reformation as we know them now. In particular, think of justification by faith alone. Erasmus called Luther Dr. Hyperbolicus because he said, it's fine to speak of justification by faith, but it's hyperbole to speak of justification by faith alone. He accused Luther of theology by exaggeration, hyperbole. That's a very interesting charge. And Erasmus may have been the first to make it against Luther and against the Reformation and against the gospel, but he would not be the last. It's also a challenge to us. Was Luther rightly Dr. Hyperbolicus? Is his theology, is his understanding of the gospel hyperbole and exaggeration? Well, the very fact that we are gathered here for this reason, and on this occasion, on the 500th anniversary in the year that Martin Luther nailed famously those 95 theses to the castle church door, commemorated just beside us, the portal we are told existing from then until now, well, we do not believe that the gospel as Martin Luther preached it, 
the gospel as the apostles preached it. The gospel, as Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, summarizes it in this text in Romans chapter 3. We do not believe that it is hyperbole. It's not exaggeration, except in the sense that the gospel is absurdity to those who are perishing. It does appear as hyperbole, a stumbling block, or foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved. It is the very power of God. I want us to think about Martin Luther's preoccupation. One of the accusations against Martin Luther in the 20th century is that he was mentally unhealthy. That's one of the worst things you can say about someone in the 20th century. 20th century human beings aren't too concerned about being saved, but they are concerned about being sane. And if not sane, then at least self-actualized, balanced. Martin Luther was not a man of balance. In fact, if you were to call Martin Luther balanced, I think he would be imbalanced in his response. Martin Luther wasn't seeking to be balanced. He was seeking to be saved. His obsession came down to the question, how could God do anything other than to hate him? What Luther made very clear is that the church in his time was insufficiently concerned with the reality of sin and far insufficiently convinced of the holiness of God. To his everlasting credit for us, Luther understood what the church had obscured. That is, the twin truths of God's holiness and of his wrath poured out upon sin. I was a seminary student, actually already a doctoral student in 1985, when Dr. R.C. Sproul's book, The Holiness of God, was published. I can still remember where I was when I read that book. In that book, you may recall, one of Dr. Sproul's chapters is entitled, The Insanity of Luther. Well, I was in a situation in which I was seeking to understand where I fit in the grand scheme of things theologically and where the gospel was to be found. Thankfully, I'd come to know the gospel personally, and I I knew how to preach the gospel. But there was a background to the preaching of the gospel that I desperately wanted to know. It was a background that had been at least referenced in terms of studies in church history. But it was Dr. Sproul who picked up the insanity of Luther and interpreting Luther through the lens of Isaiah chapter 6. made very clear that Luther's insanity, what Erasmus would call his hyperbole, is actually Luther's rightful understanding of his sinfulness and God's holiness. Luther said at one point, sometimes Christ seems to be nothing more than an angry God, to me, a judge who comes with a sword in his hand. One of the problems of popular evangelicalism is that too often it preaches only a sweet Jesus. A Jesus who's divorced from the Christ of Scripture. Richard Dawkins, one of the infamous four horsemen of the new atheism, is at least very honest when he says that many secular liberals have a false understanding of the revelation, of course what he would say, merely the literary evidence of the Scripture. He says, far too many secular liberals think that there was an angry old wrathful God in the Old Testament, but we can balance that with the sweet sentimental Jesus of the New Testament. And Dawkins said rightly, that could only be believed by people who have never read the New Testament. And he's right. When Luther heard Christ preached and came to see Christ in Scripture, he understood that Christ is the executor of the judgment of God. He saw Christ coming with a sword in his hand in wrath. This is something you do not find often in the preaching of the church today. And the problem was for Luther, of course, that this was not the gospel that he heard, not not the gospel that we just read from Romans chapter 3. We asked the question, how could the gospel have become so obscure during all the centuries? How was it that the gospel was not preached? In the very text that we just read, just in less than 10 verses, we heard a summary of the gospel that includes justification by faith alone, grace alone, propitiation, God's wrath displayed in the salvation of sinners. We saw displayed God as both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. How could that be obscured? Well, in one sense, we have to understand that one of the great heresies of the Christian church, the 
One of the first and most powerful heresies the church has had to confront is Pelagianism that ancient heresy that raises up the doctrine or the understanding of humanity and the goodness of humanity and the inherent innocence of humanity. And, and we have to understand that Pelagianism at the same time and raising up its anthropology inevitably lowered down the understanding of the God of the Bible and certainly his holiness and his wrath. The Pelagians were catastrophically countered and answered by that great church father, Augustine. But one of the lessons that we learn from church history is that heresies are perennial heresies. The worst always are. They come back again and again and again. And by the time you come to the high Middle Ages, Pelagianism is back. Not always evident in terms of the doctrinal statements of the church, but fully evident in terms of the sacramental system of the church, and fully evident in what was heard by those who were in Christian churches, who were in those churches of the Roman Catholic Church in the Middle Ages. Pelagianism was back, sometimes semi-Pelagianism, but the closer you look at the popular piety of the Middle Ages, it's not so much semi-Pelagianism as it is Pelagianism. Augustine's theological clarity had been overcome by the sacramental theology and an elevation of humanity, and especially in Luther's time of a new estimation of human intellect, will, and moral character. Accordingly, a shift of concern from the wrath of God poured out against sinners to the sacraments of the church as a way of escape. That, that shift inevitably happened once Pelagianism and semi-Pelagianism had their sway. This is reflected in the idea of the treasury of the merits of the saints. This is reflected in the entire sacramental system. It's reflected in the shift of concern amongst so many from hell in terms of eternal torment due to the righteous punishment of God to purgatory as a means whereby sinners partly saved through the act of Christ and through the sacraments of the church would be purged of their sin and thus would leave purgatory in some indefinite period which could perhaps be millennia or more and be received into Abraham's bosom. Luther's central question was this, how can a sinner be found righteous? How can God do anything other than hate the sinner? Luther felt God's hatred of sin and he knew himself to be a sinner. Luther famously was so obsessed about his sin by the measures of our contemporary psychotherapeutic worldview that Luther was horribly imbalanced. Luther would even go to Staupitz, his confessor, in such a way that he beat Staupitz down with his understanding of sin. This is the kind of man who understood sin such that he would confess his sin and then fear that he had inauthentically confessed his sin and then would fear that he had inauthentically confessed the inauthenticity of his sin. And you will say, that's mentally ill, according to the psychological and therapeutic worldview of the age. But it's true. Luther came to understand that he could not even repent right. And that's why, by the way, in our evangelical confessions, we refer to repentance as an evangelical grace. Even our repentance, our rightful repentance, is God's gift to us, not our work. For some, you might think that this question would have been speculative and hypothetical. For Luther, it was not. As a matter of fact, Luther was not troubled. Luther was terrified. Luther had a terrifying form of what John Calvin would later call the duplex cognito dei. Luther had a knowledge of God in himself, but the knowledge he had prior to his understanding of the gospel was the rightful understanding of a God of wrath as contrasted with his own sinfulness. Luther's self-knowledge, plus his knowledge of the God of the Bible, led him to a terrifying despair. Why? Because, look at the book of Romans again. Look at Romans chapter 1. Only look at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Luther understood that the wrath of God is being poured out. You'll notice the verb tense here. In, in terms of human history, in terms of even our contemporary moment, we can see evidence of the wrath of God poured out as a sign of that ultimate day of wrath, which is to come. Look at Romans 2 and verse 12. 
There's no escape. For all who have sinned without the law will perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. Now, if you understand the English language, much less the Greek, you understand that means everybody. Those under the law are rightly judged by the law, but those who have sinned without the law will perish without the law. There's no escape. Humanly speaking, there's no hope. Look at Romans chapter 3, verse 5. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. By no means. For then, how could God judge the world? But if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do the evil that good may come, as some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just? Notice very carefully what Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is writing here. He says in verse 5 that our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God. Luther knew that to be true in his life. His own unrighteousness revealed to him the righteousness of God. Centuries later, the neo-Orthodox theologians would refer to this as the infinite qualitative distinction between God and humanity. That's at least something they got right. The infinite qualitative distinction between God and humanity. In other words, the distinction qualitatively is infinite. And the more you contemplate it, the more evident that becomes. Look again. Look at Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So that every mouth may be stopped. Luther's mouth was stopped, perhaps most famously, at his first Mass as a monk. We will we'll come to understand that Luther, the harder he worked to be a monk, the more in his own eyes he failed in terms of demonstrating the righteousness incumbent to a monk. We all love his statement where he said, if any monk could have been saved by his monkery, it was I. Well, that wasn't hypothetical. Luther was trying. He was trying his very best. His father, who had opposed his entrance into the order, had come with his friends, having made a massive donation by contemporary standards to the church in order to observe his son's first mass as presiding priest. You know the story. Luther got up and said the words of introduction to the Mass. We offer unto thee the living, the true, eternal God. He heard himself say this. And then he said, retrospectively, at these words, I was utterly stupefied and terror-stricken. Who am I that I should lift up mine eyes or raise my hands to the living God? The angels surround him. At his nod, the earth trembles. And shall I, a miserable little pygmy, Say, I want this, I ask for that. For I'm dust, he said, am ashes and full of sin. And I am to be speaking to the living eternal and the true God? Luther fled, as you know. He, he could not fulfill the mechanism of the Mass. He could not speak. His mouth was still. It would seldom be still thereafter. But at that moment, it was stilled. He knew what it meant for his mouth to be shut. Well, we move on to Romans chapter 3, verses 21 and following. Erasmus calls Luther Dr. Hyperbolicus, precisely because of Luther's preaching and defense of the gospel. You'll recall that as Luther spoke of his power experience, he said these words, Therefore I did not love a just and angry God, but rather hated and murmured against him. Yet 
He says, I clung to the dear Paul and had a great yearning to know what he meant. He clung to the dear Paul. How many of us, by the way, would have the same testimony? At some point, at many points, rightfully, continuously through our Christian lives, we cling to the dear Paul because of his clarity on the gospel, just as in this text from Romans chapter 3. Luther's immediate reference was to Romans chapter 1, verse 17, the just shall live by his faith. Luther wanted to know what that meant. And of course, in that experience, we know it's the tower experience. Luther came to know what that meant, and he came to know Christ. And as he would say, it was as if the windows of heaven were opened unto me. It was an entire new world that Luther came to understand, the world of grace, the way of salvation. Erasmus's indictment of Luther Dr. Hyperbolicus, was the charge that Luther just took everything too far. Sin, preach it. But totally sinful? Always sinful? Irredeemably sinful? Hyperbole. Faith in Christ? Yes, of course. But without the sacraments of the church? Impossible. Without the dispensation of grace by the church? Impossible. Without the infusion of righteousness by means of the sacraments? Hyperbole. The will affected by sin, most famously in the exchange between Luther and Erasmus, yes, affected by sin, but corrupted, bound by sin? No. Hyperbole. Scripture as authority, of course, Erasmus, who himself loved the Scriptures, would hardly have argued against the Scripture as authority. He argued for the Scripture as authority, and early in the Reformation, he even thought that he would be supportive of Martin Luther until he came to understand what Luther meant by the Scripture principle, by the recourse, the rescue to the Word of God. What do you mean? Luther meant alone. When Luther spoke those words at the Diet of Worms, when Luther made those arguments he made in the Leipzig Disputation, when Luther had to answer without horns and without teeth with the emperor of the Holy Roman emperor, Empire, Charles V, with his life on the line, Luther said, if I have to answer without horns and without teeth, and as you know, I skipped to the end when he said, my conscience is bound by the word of God. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Erasmus was with him until the sola, until Scripture alone, hyperbole. What Erasmus hated is what we will now call the solas, not articulated in exactly that way in terms of Luther's lifetime, but defended by Luther in their essence, every single one of them repeatedly and then consistently. So what did Luther see that Erasmus did not? One of the things we have to note is that in the 20th century, there has been a horrifying reduction in the holiness of God, and that has come, as we've already noted, with the reduction in the preaching of the wrath of God. And it's not by accident. The 19th century theological liberals sought to redefine God absent of his omni-attributes, that is, absent of what we know as classical theism. Adolf von Harnack, famously of Berlin, argued that the gospel was found within a kernel that was now surrounded by a husk, as you might think in a piece of fruit. And the husk was Greek philosophy, he said, as he, he spoke of the acute Hellenization of dogma. He said all these omnis, omnipotence, omnipresence, omniscience, and all the claims of classical theism are, are basically an import of classical Greek philosophy onto the scriptures. Of course, every single one of them, as we know, is actually affirmed, declared, quite clearly in Scripture. But one of the things that was accomplished by this de-Hellenization project in terms of, of rescuing God from 19 centuries of classical theism was to reduce God in terms of wrath. God was still ill-disposed to sin, but wrath, no. And that turned theology into a moralism that fit a cultural Christianity. The gospel was obscured. But the wrath of God was then openly denied. By the time you come to the 20th century, one of the central projects of many theologians is to deny the interpretation of Scripture where the word we know as propitiation appears 
and to try to make it mere expiation. In other words, there was no change, they would argue, in the character of God toward sinners. Rather, it's the exact opposite. It was that there was a change by the revelation and by the saving acts of God in the disposition of sinful humans towards God. In other words, God sent Jesus in order that we might have a better opinion of himself. By the time we come to Romans chapter 3, we have to understand that this is exactly the opposite of what Paul here preaches. But now, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. As you know in the Apostle Paul, these but nows are always introducing the very essence of the gospel. But now, we were dead in our sins and trespasses. As we read here in verse 28, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. As we come to understand this, you see that in verse 23, we come to understand what Luther understood about himself and about humanity. But notice something you may have missed. Look at verse 5 of Romans 3. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God. And then look at verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to us, to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there's no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Paul, in one chapter, here in the book of Romans, says that there is a revelation of the righteousness of God. The first revelation of the righteousness of God is in our unrighteousness. Our unrighteousness contrasted with the righteousness of God. Our depravity contrasted with the holiness of God. But then in just a few verses, he tells us that now, but now, the righteousness of God has been manifested, apart from the law, though the law and the prophets bear witness to it. What is it then? In verse 22, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Okay, that's the promise. The promise is that even though in times past God's righteousness was revealed in our unrighteousness, but now, and that but now is on the other side of the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's on the other side of Christ's accomplished atoning work. Now God's righteousness is demonstrated in the present time in the salvation of sinners through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. But how? How? We desperately want to know how. Paul wants to show us how. Luther desperately needed to know how. How can God's righteousness at one point, just a few verses ago, be demonstrated in our unrighteousness to the outpouring of his wrath? And then just a few verses later, his righteousness is demonstrated in the salvation of those who believe in Christ Jesus. How? This is not just for some, it's for all, in, in the sense that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then in verse 24, and are justified. There's that word Luther was looking for, justified. How can a sinner be declared just? How can it be? How can it be promised? Here it is. And are justified by his grace as a gift. How? Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. How? Whom God put forth whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received, how? By faith. Why? This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he passed over former sins. His wrath was not poured out in former days as it rightfully and righteously would have been and might have been he instead stayed his wrath against sin until he sent his own son. For while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him might not perish but have everlasting life. It was to show his righteousness at the present time. The present time. That, that's in contrast to times past. So Romans chapter 3 verse 5 is in contrast to what we see in Romans chapter 21 and following. But now it was to show his righteousness at the present time. 
so that he might be just. He was just in chapter 3, verse 5. He was infinitely just. He is infinitely just. But now in Christ, he is also the justifier, the one who has faith in Jesus. We still have to look at the how. Look how Paul answers the how. Christ Jesus, verse 25, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. It's an objective atonement. It's an accomplished atonement. It is an atonement for us, unilaterally accomplished by God in Christ for sinners. It is an atonement declared to all such that all who are sinners might come to a knowledge of their sin and a knowledge of God's wrath and turn to the only rescue, and that rescue is Christ Jesus, whom God not only put forward as a propitiation in blood, but whom God also raised from the dead on the third day as he had promised. So Erasmus called Luther Dr. Hyperbolicus, what he hated was the gospel that Luther would later preach. Speaking of Romans chapter 3, verse 21, Luther, in speaking of his translation, would say this. This verse is, in his words, and I quote, the chief point in the very central place of the epistles. Okay. But then he continued, and the whole Bible. The whole Bible, right here, in the text we just read. Luther said, this is the turning point. This is the very central place, not only of the epistles, but of the whole Bible. Biblical theology comes down to this hinge, the hinge that is found here in Romans chapter 3, verses 21 and following. To know Luther's translation of the Scripture is to know that it became controversial because in Romans chapter 3, verse 28 in the Luther Bible, it is translated now from Greek to German to English in these words. So now we hold that man is justified without the help of the works of the law, alone through faith. A line in the German. He was criticized. He responded to the criticism by saying this, I know very well that in Romans 3, the word solum is not in the Greek or Latin text. The papist did not have to teach me that. It's a fact that the letters S-O-L-A are not there. And those blockheads stare at them like cows at a new gate. While at the same time, they do not recognize that it conveys the sense of the text. If the translation is to be clear and vigorous, klar, he said, in gewaltiglich, it belongs there. I wanted to speak German, not Latin or Greek, since it was German I'd set about to speak in the translation. So much, he said, for translating the nature of language. However, I was not depending on or following the nature of languages alone when I inserted, when I inserted the word solum in Romans 3. The text itself, he said, and St. Paul's meaning urgently require and demand it. For in that passage, he is dealing with the main point of Christian doctrine, namely, that we are justified by faith in Christ without any works of the law. Paul excludes all works so completely as to say that the works of the law, though it is God's law and word, do not aid us in justification. Using Abraham as an example, he argues that Abraham was so justified without works that even the highest work, which had been commanded by God over and above all others, namely circumcision, did not aid him in justification. Rather, Abraham was justified without circumcision and without any works, but by faith. Romans 3.28, according to Luther, for we hold that one is justified alone apart from the works of the law. What had Luther been taught to rely upon? Self-denial, self-discipline, monastic vows, sacraments, penance, last rites, holy orders, on and on, indulgences. He'd been told to trust in the work of the sacraments, ex opere operato, such that even the theological or spiritual disposition of the participants in the sacraments really didn't matter. Luther understood that that was not a confusion of the gospel. It was an anti-gospel. It wasn't a weak gospel. Evangelicalism is afflicted by so much weak gospel, but this was not weak gospel. This was no gospel. And Luther understood what had to be denied in order for the gospel to be affirmed. One of the things we need to note is that it was the solas 
as we know them, that got Luther into trouble and got him called Dr. Hyperbolicus by Erasmus. And you have to understand that the Roman Catholic Church was happy with every one of them without Sola. The Roman Catholic Church today would be very happy with all of them, just not Sola. This is the gospel Luther preached. Erasmus, by the way, even Luther conceded, could be right on the basis of human logic alone. But that's the way that leads to damnation, not to salvation. This is where sola scriptura was for Luther, not something we might reduce to a motto or a mantra. For Luther, it was life and death. If God spoke in his word, then it's God's word on God's authority alone. If God has not spoken in his word, then we're doomed. If God has spoken in his word, and Luther firmly believed that God has spoken in his word. It is the very word of God that we find in Scripture. Luther said, if then God has spoken and he has told us of his gospel, then this is the gospel. There isn't any other gospel. This is the gospel that saves. Modern people tend to believe that our problem is something outside of us and that we are to look inside of us for salvation. That's the the foundation of the modern psychotherapeutic worldview. It's the, it's the assumption of most people. Something happened to me, and I need help. I've got to look within for that help. I've got to summon up the wisdom. I've got to, I've got to bring myself to a new level of consciousness. I've got to engage myself in some form of self-improvement. That's an anti-gospel. Instead, what the Scripture reveals is that the problem is not outside of us. The problem is inside of us. And the salvation is not going to come at all from inside of us, but only from outside of us, which is why Luther understood that there is no righteousness in us, which is what he understood so clearly from God's Word, even from the Apostle Paul. He came to understand that the only righteousness that could save and would save and does save is an alien righteousness the righteousness of Christ that is imputed to the believer by faith. Well, so here we stand. Here we are 500 years later. It's rather horrifyingly humbling to preach with Luther at one's feet. The earthly remains. And the gospel of Jesus Christ tells us that that's not insignificant. On one day, the quick and the dead shall be raised. One day, Luther and Melanchthon and the assorted princes and counts buried in this room will be raised on that great day, the day of judgment. Martin Luther would have us to know that there is no safety on that day, but Christ. I can't stand here without thinking that just a few years after Luther's death, very quickly, the tables were turned politically and the Catholic princes gained control here in Wittenberg and in Saxony. Charles V and his victorious armies came right here. Charles V stood at Luther's grave. The Roman Catholic Church hoped that he would order that Luther, the great heretic, would be exhumed and his bones burned and thrown into the Elbe. That's what they did to Wycliffe when they exhumed him by the, the edict against him from the Council of Constance, ordering his death inconveniently for the church. He died before they could execute him. So they dug up his body, as you do with a heretic, and they burned his bones and threw Wycliffe in the River Swift. Charles V did not do that to Luther. Luther's body is here because it was buried here and because Charles V did not order him dug up and his bones burned and thrown in the river. But it wouldn't have mattered to Luther. The body they may kill. His truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Luther's confidence was that in times past, the righteousness of God had been revealed in our unrighteousness. But now, God's righteousness is made manifest through the justification and salvation of sinners 
by means of the atoning work of Christ in which a propitiation was fulfilled. The penalty for sin was paid. And God's disposition towards sinners was changed so that, as Paul tells us in Romans chapter 3, we may know him not only as just, but as the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And thus we are saved. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for bringing us to this place. May we stand not with merely Luther, and may we stand not only with the Apostle Paul, but may we stand with all the saints throughout all the ages, with the patriarchs and the prophets and the apostles, by the power of God in the Lord King Jesus Christ, whoever reigns. May we be steadfast, not in our power but in Christ, and not to our glory but his. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.